How you been? I've been fine. Yeah? I've been fine. Thank you for asking. Tell me what you've been up to since I saw you last. I haven't been to Detroit for, God, I don't know how long. Yeah, it's been an interesting time since the last time you came to Detroit. You came uh, when I put the book uh, Have a Little Faith out, and then after that a couple other ones, and you helped us open a medical clinic there yep. with one of my charities in, in Detroit. Um, and we miss you, and you need to come back. Since I saw you last, it's been a kind of tumultuous four or five years, I lost both my parents and I lost a little girl who we were raising as our daughter uh, from our orphanage in Haiti. And to kind of, you know, sort of become parentless and then become a parent in a short period of time was a real kind of flip for me. Yeah, that really is. And your daughter that you're talking about is Chica, yeah. who you adopted from your orphanage in Haiti. Mm -hmm. What a spirit she was. And <laughs> you've said before, and I think you're right, she had brain cancer, right? A tumor yeah. in her brain. And you said before, you don't think she ever knew she had a bad deal, right? No. She didn't know she was sick. She didn't know anything yeah. was different. You know, it's, it's funny uh, you mentioned that because a lot of people I, I found out have different attitudes towards when kids get sick. Some of them tell them everything. Uh, they nicknamed the tumor, Timmy the tumor, he's in your brain. He's got... I didn't do any of that, I have to tell you. I believe in children being children. She was five when she got this, and for two years uh, we brought her to America and, and, and basically adopted her, traveled around the world trying to cure it, and I never said what it was that was wrong with her, and she never asked. What was interesting was she said she had to go to the doctor, okay, and she had two brain surgeries, and she had... Um, all kinds of uh, treatments, uh, immunology treatments in Germany and treatments at Sloan Kettering in New York, and never once said, what's the matter with me? Just occasionally said, when am I going to get better, like all kids do, so mm -hmm. I can go back and be with my friends. And we kind of treated it like that. Was she self-aware to the extent that she could recognize that she was different from other children in the way that she walked or could manipulate yeah. and do things. Was she aware of the difference? When when it physically manifested itself, yeah. At the beginning, she her face just drooped a little bit, mm -hmm. her eyes and her mouth, and she didn't really notice a whole lot there. Look, in Haiti, you know, I, have, I run an orphanage in Haiti. We have 47 kids. Some of those kids were abandoned in the woods, left to die. Uh, some of those kids... Their parents were killed in an earthquake in 10 seconds, and they were, we have one girl who roamed around the country for almost two years not knowing where she belonged until somebody brought her to us. They all come from different backgrounds. They all have different things. So there's not a lot of mocking or poking fun or anything like that. They're just very accepting. When she came to America, Chica, she was kind of a typical kid and running around and doing all those things. As she lost the ability to walk, and, 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 and talk normally and things like that, she began to notice. And I think most poignantly, that was pointed out to us one day when she was, we, she was talking about getting married. She always, for first five, six, and seven-year-olds, she talked a lot about getting married. <laughs> and she said, I want to fall in love like you, you know, like you and Miss Janine did. I said, oh, okay. Well, who are you going uh, to marry? And there was this boy that she, you know, kind of knew. And she said, how about him? And she said, oh, he would never marry me. And we said, well, why not? And she said, he won't marry a girl who can't walk. And, you know, it just hit us like a, a ton of bricks. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, we didn't, we weren't aware that she was self-aware like that. And uh, that's, I think, when we knew that she was aware that something was different. That's pretty profound for her age. Yes, it to was. To get that and to also project it socially to have an awareness that that would be something that someone else would value or not value. Yeah. That's pretty amazing, yeah, actually. Yeah, and heartbreaking. For sure. To talk about her a little bit, how is Janine doing with that loss? I think Janine struggles with it um, very constantly, uh, every day. There's some kind of tears, some kind of, uh, you know, I miss Chica. You know, for us it was a little unique because we didn't have children of our own. And, uh, you know, we have 47 down in 80, but all of a sudden here was one in our house and sleeping at the foot of our bed. And we went from not having children to having one every minute 
of every day. She didn't go off to school. She didn't go visit relatives someplace else. She was with us every minute of every day. And to have that and to have her, you know, sleeping in the bed between us and giggling and tickling and all that kind of stuff and then to have it gone is very, very difficult. And my, my wife, Janine, misses her extraordinarily. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad we had her with us right until the very end. Um, we never put her in a hospital, uh, you know, or, or anything like that. She was at home when she passed away, and m we were on both sides of her in her little bed, and we held her in literally until her final heartbeat. And, um, and I like to think uh, that we didn't lose a child, we were given a child. And I like to think that she didn't lose a life. She was given one, and at least in the last couple of years, she had what she always wanted, which was a de facto mommy and daddy on both sides of her. Yeah. You know? The truth is, sadly, when couples go through a loss like that, it has an effect on the relationship and the marriage, and more often than not, it breaks a relationship yes. and a marriage. Has it put a strain and a stress on your relationship with Janine? Uh yeah, well, sure. I mean, but only because sadness is never a good ingredient for the stew of a marriage, you know. Uh, but not not in any kind of threatening to the foundation way. We've been together an awful long time, and we both feel the same sadness. I think what happens to couples that you're talking about is when one seems to get over it faster than the other one. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, why are you taking so long to get over it? We need to move on. Well, how can we move on? Well, you're being insensitive. You're being... I think that's the kind of thing, you know, or, or sometimes they don't want to be together because it reminds them too much of the happy times that they now don't have. But we talk a lot about it and we're constantly uh, bringing it up. And we're looking at pictures and we watch videos. We don't pretend it didn't happen. There's lots of pictures that you go around the house and all that. And, um, you know, my work and my life is a lot about this. Uh, in fact, the loss of her is sort of what ended up, you know, pushing me to write this current book and a bunch of other things in my life. So it's around us. It's a constant theme and we talk about it. But you're absolutely right. There is no strain like that. They say money breaks up, you know, couples more than anything else, yeah. except perhaps... Uh, something over the children and a loss of a child can really be tough. So we're fortunate that it hasn't had that kind of an effect. Yeah, that's very fortunate. I did not expect that it would have that kind of effect because I know Janine and I know you as a couple. My goal in having this sit down with you is I want people to learn some things about you that they may not know. You're one of those rare people that doesn't particularly like talking about themselves. So this is going to be like getting a root canal for you. Okay. So just get ready for it. Uh, <laughs> so seriously, people know your writing, but they don't particularly know you and your history and your background, which I think is really, really interesting. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. You originally are from where? Philadelphia area, South Jersey, Philadelphia. How long were you in Philadelphia and New Jersey? Grew up there until I was about 16, 17, went off to college and never went back. Did you like it there? Yeah. Uh, it was a good place to come from. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't in my cards to go back. When I left, I left. I still, you know, have an affinity for cheesesteaks and soft pretzels and hoagies and, yeah. and the iggles, as we call them. But, but Philly is my hometown, but that's not where I built my life. So what are iggles? The Eagles, the Philadelphia oh, okay, Eagles. That's just right. how we say it. Just had to get that out. <laughs> I sold programs, you know. It was my first job. I sold programs when I was 11 years old at Vet Stadium where the Phillies and the Eagles would play games. And I was so short. I'm not particularly tall now, but back then I think I was like four foot nine. And they gave me a, a bag, a sack of programs that weighed more than I did. And I had to put it on my shoulder and walk up and down the steps of the stadium going, programs, yearbooks, scorecards, what? It's like that because my voice hadn't changed. And uh, I did that for two years. That was my first job. I'd go like travel all the way over there, make $4, and then turn around and go back home. But I got to see all the baseball games and the football games, which was pretty cool for an 11-year-old kid. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. When you got out of there, you went where? 
Uh, I went to college early. I was I skipped my senior year, so I was barely. I think I just turned seventeen when I went off to college, yeah. and I went to Brandeis University, where I met a professor named Maury Schwartz. Having no idea, he was the first professor, first class I took. Seriously, yeah. that was your first class. First class I took was freshman year, first semester. Walked in to hear. You want to hear about you know sliding doors? So I signed up for the class ahead of time. Didn't know what it was. It was an intro to sociology, some class like that. And I walked into the class, and there were nine kids in the room. And being a typical freshman, I mean, he said, no, 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 this is much too small. To, you know, If I cut the class, they'll, they'll know I'm not here. I wanted like one of those big lecture hall classes. Yeah, give so me 350, I was, right? Yeah, I was literally turning around to go drop the class because, you know, you had two weeks you could drop your class. And he started to call roll. And one of the problems when your last name begins with A is that you cannot get out fast enough. Yeah. And I heard him say, you know, Mitchell album. And I was in the doorway and I could have kept going because he, he wouldn't know it was me. Right. And I could have kept walking to the registrar. And if I did, I promise you, I would not be sitting here with you right now. I guarantee you that. My whole life would have been different if I had kept walking. But the guilt in me, you know, I heard my name. So I raised my hand and I said, here. And he looked at me and he said, is it Mitch or Mitchell? Which do you prefer? Now, you know, that doesn't mean anything to anybody who's listening, I'm sure. But I had one of those names that, you know, Mitch, Mitchy, Mitchell. You could call me all these different things. So I said, well, Mitch, actually, my friends call me Mitch. And he said, Mitch it is. And Mitch? And I said, yeah. He said, I hope one day you'll think of me as your friend. So I knew cutting the class was out of the question at that yeah. point. And, and that began that whole relationship with Maury, which, of course, it spanned all four years. I took every class he offered. I majored in sociology just because of him. I wasn't all that interested in it, to be honest, but I had all those credits. <laughs> Would have been a shame to waste them. And that was that relationship that became so special that many years later, when he was dying from Lou Gehrig's disease, would um, suddenly pull me back draw me back to his final months of his life and literally turn my entire life on its end when I wrote the book Tuesdays with Maury. How long between you taking four years of classes with him and you getting back into his life? 16 years. 16 years. Without a word. Now that's, I, I want, because you know, you're going to, if I know you, you're going to try to compliment me. So I'm going to try to beat you to the punch because I don't deserve it. From 16, from the time I graduated and Maury gave me this big hug, I bought him a little briefcase for his, uh, you know, graduation. I, you know, I never bought anything for a teacher before. I, probably the cheapest briefcase in the world, but I gave it to him and he started to cry a little bit, which wasn't unusual for him. And he gave me this big hug and he said, Mitch, you're one of the good ones. Promise me you'll stay in touch. And I said, okay, I promise. Promise. I said, I promise. Say it in a sentence. <laughs> Like I'm a kid. I said, okay, I promise I'll stay in touch, you know. And then I graduated and I went off into the world to become very, very ambitious, first in music and then in, in, in journalism and sports writing. And I broke that promise every day, week, month, and year for 16 years. So before anybody thinks I'm doing anything great by writing Tuesdays with Maury, I should have seen him every year for 16 years before I started seeing him the last 16 Tuesdays of his life. And shame on me for not doing that. And it was only by happening to see him on television talking to Ted Koppel about what it was like to die from Lou Gehrig's disease that I found out that he was even sick. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even known. And again, I wouldn't be here sitting with you. So yeah. it was a mistake and a bad one that, that led me ultimately to see him again. We'll come back to those 16 Tuesdays. But in that ensuing 16 years, what did you do? First, I was a musician. That's my first love. Um, I never wrote anything in high school or college. You know, people who come up to me and say, well, I want to be a writer, but I'm 21. I think it's too late. I said, too late. I, I, I didn't even write. I didn't even begin writing until like 23 or 24. And uh, I was a musician. I wanted to be a record producer. I, I lived over in Europe. I once had a gig, believe it or not, in the island of Crete in Greece, where I was the featured American singer and performer. And this was so far off the beaten path that I used to do like Elvis Presley songs and things like that. And I think they thought they were originals. <laughs> like, it's like, hey, this guy's pretty good. Who do you, where do you get this music from? 
And I had this amazing life over there for a brief period of time where I was like king of this little fishing village and island where the resort was. And I could oh, stand Elvis in. Elvis moved in. We yeah. discovered Elvis. Yeah. They didn't know who Elvis was. So I was Elvis. And uh, for some crazy reason, I decided I have to come back to New York because I wanted to start my career. And I should have just stayed there because once I eventually got back to New York, all I met were a bunch of older musicians who said, boy, if I could ever get a job on like an island somewhere, I would never, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm like, uh-oh. You didn't know you'd already arrived. I didn't know I had had it. And so I worked in the music business for two, three years, and I failed. I mean, you know, in terms of if you're measuring success, I never had any. I, I wasn't into drugs, and drugs were very big back in 1980, 81, 82, during those years. You couldn't really kind of make connections and get ahead if you weren't partying, and, and that kind of left me out. And eventually, after, you know, the love of my life, which was music, didn't, didn't work out, I, I said, well, I know I want to do something creative, um, but music is starting to become my enemy. You know, like I loved it so much, and then all of a sudden I was resenting it. And that's terrible. And I've met wise people over the years who have said, maybe your vocation and your avocation should not be the same thing. So I decided to try something creative but not music and um there was a local newspaper that they gave out in supermarkets and i happened to pick one up and it said if you have some free time uh we could use some volunteers writing and i never wrote anything before but i did have free time because i worked at night as a musician so i went over there and uh i was like the youngest person there by 30 years and they said well can you do an assignment for us write a story and I said Okay, what? They said, well, they're going to raise the parking meter rates from $0.05 cents to $0.10 cents on 108th Street in Queens. Go out and do a story about it. I'd never written anything, Phil, nothing. You know, And all I knew about journalism was the movie All the President's Men. Right. <laughs> so, so I went there with a little notepad, and I was like the most dogged reporter about, why are you raising the, the things $0.05 cents to $0.10? Cents? And you know, I did what I read in newspapers. You write one little paragraph that says what it is, then you use a quote, and then you write more paragraphs, and then you use another quote. So I gave it to them, and they took it. And the next week I was in the supermarket, and uh, I picked up the – little weekly newspaper and there was my story on the bottom of the front page and with my name on it and I had one of those goosebumpy kind of feelings it's like wow you know I, I created something I wrote something and there's my name on it and I guess I was I was hooked ever since when did you write your first sports column that came uh a few years later after I had um you know I'll tell you a funny story about becoming a sports writer everybody thinks you know, you, you kill to get into that profession, right? You, oh, oh you know, who wouldn't want to be a sports writer? I want to be a sports writer. I had no desire to be a sports writer. I, I, was, I was trying, you know, I ended up going back to journalism school. I went to Columbia. I got my master's there. And, and I wanted to write like Tom Wolfe, you know, the big feature pieces about American life and all the rest of that. So that's what I wanted to do. But I needed to help pay my tuition. So they had a little thing on the job board. And one of the things was work as like an intern at Sport Magazine. So I took it, I got it, I went down there, and every little piece I wrote was, you know, about sports. So at the end of the year when you're done, you have your clips. You know, clips are like your little resumes, yeah. right? So I was reading these advertisements, and, uh, and there was an ad in a, a publication called Editor and Publisher, which was the Bible then of the industry. And it said, wanted a Sunday magazine writer for a Southeastern daily. And that's exactly the job I want. I want to write those big pieces. So I sent my resume and all I really had were these sports clips. So I sent those clips. Okay. I don't hear anything for a couple of weeks. I go on a freelance assignment. I pay my own way to go to Finland for the Helsinki, Finland, for the World Track and Field Championships, because I, I could do a freelance for the Track and Field magazine. Yeah. I'm in Finland in this little hotel room, and my phone rings, and I it's like <laughs> in the, the hotel phone. I didn't have a phone. You know, we didn't have a phone. And it's, I say hello, and he says, is this Mitch Album? I said, yeah. Uh, this is Fred Turner. I'm the sports editor with the Fort Lauderdale News and Sun Sentinel. I said, yeah. He says, you know that Sunday magazine job you applied for? I said, yeah. You didn't get it. I said, you're calling me in Finland to tell me I didn't get a job? He said, well, the guy who was looking at that, he uh, saw your sports clips and he brought them over to me and I read them and I think they're pretty good. And if you want a job as a sports writer, you know, uh, I might hire you. So I came back to America and I went down to Fort Lauderdale. I got the job and I was in sports ever since. Wow. So that was in what year? 1983. 
So you've been doing that now for 30 years. 30 plus years. Yeah. Do you like it now? Sports writing? Yeah. You have to say yes. Uh, I, I, I always like writing about sports because I try to use sports to sort of tell other stories and bigger stories. But the industry is not as much fun as it used to be uh, because now every athlete has their own Twitter account. And so they don't really need to talk to sports writers. And now all the news is, you know, by the time a newspaper comes out, it's such old news that there's no point in writing about the game. Everybody's seen the game, analyzed the game, broken the game down, tweeted about the game. You look like you're the last guy to the party all the time. So, you know, writing a column is fairly safe because – you're offering opinion or analysis and things like that. And I still enjoy, you know, the big games. But honestly, Phil, you know, when you live long enough, you do see that sports are just sports. Sports. And, you know, yeah. it's hard for me to get as excited as, let's say, the people who paint their faces green and white and put cheese on their yeah. heads and go out and say, I, I often look at that and I go, that's a little more than I want to be into something. You yeah, know? but you write about the people inside yeah. the game. Yeah. What the game means beyond the game yeah and i've always defended that you know sometimes people say oh it's just sports i say what do you mean it's just sports you say that it's just politics it's just business it's just whatever you know people get passionate about sports there are winners there are losers there are people who overcome all kinds of things you can tell every story about life on the sports pages and i've i've tried to do that and i've always written uh more about the losers to be honest than the winners because i think they're more interesting yeah and uh the small stories versus the big ones i've covered as a sports writer, I, I, I mean, I've covered World Series and Super Bowls a million times, but the most interesting things were like when I covered the Iditarod dog sled race and went through the whole thing for 17 days in Alaska or ran with the bulls in Pamplona, you know, or, or, or did these oddball things and found these little small stories that nobody else wrote about. And it's the human side of it that makes what you write about sports interesting. And I have to say, I played football in grade school, junior high, high school, and college, and coaches would always say, come on, men, teach about life, and we'd always roll our eyes like, oh, yeah, come on. But I have to say, in retrospect, when you get out in life and you get married, you get a job, you get in your career, you hit adversity, you do think back to fourth quarter, a minute to go, it's fourth and three, and somehow or another, you wind up winning a game, and you go, it ain't over. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd never give up. You really do learn about teamwork, leadership, perseverance. There's a lot more to sports than just running up and down the field and jumping up. Yep, there is. But what you're talking about is participation, which I think is absolutely true. Fandom, I'm not sure it teaches you that. No. Not quite the same way, anyhow. No, I don't think so. But being part of a team does yep. and leadership, being able to count on somebody and be counted on and all those things. Yeah. Persevering, learning to lose and get back up. I mean, those things matter. And those are the things you talk about. So yeah. that's interesting. How'd you wind up in Detroit? Uh, I was working for Lauderdale for a couple of years. I started to write a column. I, I won some kind of national award, and it got me on the uh, radar of places that were looking to hire people. And it just so happened that a guy in Detroit named Mike Downey, who ended up out here in Los Angeles writing for the LA Times, he took the job to come to Los Angeles, leaving a spot open in Detroit. And um, there was a big newspaper war going on in Detroit at the time, you know, that's when the you know, the era of two newspapers in one town. There was the afternoon paper, the news, and the morning paper, the free press. And uh, somehow they both called me within like an hour uh, asking me to come up for an interview for the, their job. They, they all knew, I guess, what the other one was doing. So yeah. in fairness, um, A, I told them that they, the other one had called, and B, uh, I flew up. I let one of you know, they fly up, so I let one of them pay me, pay for my ticket to go up and the other one to pay for my ticket to go back. And I stayed in a hotel room. And the first day when I interviewed with one, I stayed. Then I checked out and checked back in to the same room <laughs> so that it would be totally fair. And don't you know that after I interviewed with both of them, I went back home and they called me within a few minutes of one another. Both of them offered me the job for the exact same money. Now, how can that possibly be? There's some kind of collusion or whatever going on. And I took the one with the morning paper, the Detroit Free Press, which was, turns out in hindsight, was absolutely the right move. Uh, it was a good place for me. 
And uh, I've, I'm still there. I still, I don't write very often, but I'm still there. Let's fast forward. Of course, radio, this has been a huge piece, right? Radio, I was one of the first guys in sports writing to go on radio. And I remember Tony Kornheiser, for example, who you now see on PTI and all that, would rib me unmercifully. Oh, Mr. Radio, you know, and I would you know, kind of come and see you, you know, because at that time, if you were, you were supposed to be a purist, you just write and you do radio. But I was young and I said, well, what's the matter with being on the radio? And then everybody was on the radio all of a sudden. And then Mr. Television, because I did ESPN, and, and then everybody was on television. Now I'm way behind all of them. They, everybody has a show and everybody has a radio show and I just dabble in it a little bit. But yeah, sports is a very explosive thing. And I was, I rode that wave. Now, you and I have been friends for how long? Mm. A long time, right? Yeah, a long time. I, if, it's, if it's so long that you can't remember, then it's a long time. Yeah, it's like going on 20 years. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's Yeah, because after there. Tuesdays with Maury came out, it was more than 20 years ago. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, a long time. You've come to Detroit. I, ca- I came to New York with you a couple things. We, uh, we, we've been, you've been very, very gracious to me. You've, you've helped me far more than I've helped you. Once in a while, you asked me to help you a little bit on something here or there when you were coming on with new shows and stuff, and I was so happy. Thank God I could do something for you. Oh, uh, not true, uh, and, not true. But you've done a great deal for me. Well, we've been good friends. It's kind of odd because we've been in kind of wide orbits and yeah. stuff, but Somehow or another, we connected and have grown a friendship over yeah. the years. And your wife and my wife. Yeah, they love each other, that's for sure. Yeah. Let's fast forward to those 16 Tuesdays hmm. because you have writing that deals with death and dying, what it means, and life after death. You deal with all of that in that cycle. So you see. Ted Koppel talking to your old professor. Right. What made you get back in touch? Guilt. Was he surprised to hear from you? When I was in college, I used to call Maury coach. That was like a sports affectation. And by the time 16 years had passed, I'd totally forgotten that. So when I saw him on Nightline, I looked up his number. It was still listed. I dialed it. Um, A nurse answered. I asked for him. She hands, you hear the phone like kind of being dropped or whatever. And then he picks up, hello. And the first thing out of my mouth was, Professor Schwartz, my name is Mitch Album. I was a student of yours in the 70s. I don't know if you remember me. The first thing out of his mouth was, how come you didn't call me coach? So needless to say, by the end of that conversation, I was going to visit him because guilt is a very powerful motivator, Phil. And, uh, you know, so what I thought would be a one-time phone call, then I thought, well, I'll go visit him and it'll be a one-time visit. And, uh, you know, even in the driving there, and again, I want to tell people I was, it was not magnanimous. I was, I was thinking I'll be here for one, uh, you know, I was looking at my watch. And when I rented the car, back in those days, people didn't have cell phones, but you could rent them. And I rented a car with a cell phone so I could talk to ESPN. And I drove into Maury's neighborhood. And it was a warm day, I remember. And he had his nurses carry him out in the wheelchair to wait for me, unbeknownst to me, because he wanted to greet me, like, right at the curb, you know. And I come driving down the street. I'm on the phone with ESPN talking about something or another that couldn't possibly matter now. And I see him kind of up ahead. And I hit the brakes. And of course, the proper thing to do would be to throw the cell phone out the window and run out and give him a hug, right? And I'd like to say that that's what I did. I would like to say that that's what I did, but I did not. What I did was stop the car and slide down under the (laughs) dashboard, making like I was looking for my keys. And I laid on the floor of that rental car for three or four minutes, finishing that conversation with ESPN. Because at that point in my life, you know, work came first and everything else could wait even a dying old man. So before anybody gives me any compliments about Tuesdays with Maury, that's who I was when I first went to see him. Right. You did pull up eventually after you let him (laughs) cook in the sun. (laughs) Yeah, he was cooking in the sun. He was in a wheelchair. And I went in and I saw him. um, And I was so taken, Phil, in that meeting. It was like going back in time. I always say this to people about, you know, if you had a really good teacher in your life, anytime you see them again, 
You become a pupil and they're your teacher. You're like sitting in a little desk all of a sudden. I don't care if you're 60 years old. You see your kindergarten teacher and you're 60. You are back in that little desk and they are your teacher, Miss whatever or Mr. whatever. And I went back to sort of, but sitting with him, I, I was like transported back to being a student. And I guess in hindsight, I was a better person when I was a student. You know, I hadn't had all this ambition. I hadn't done all this chasing of accomplishments and things. And I liked myself when I was sitting with him. And he, he didn't know this new me. He just knew the old college version of me. And he never asked about how much money I made. He never asked about my job. He just asked like, are you happy with your life? Have you found somebody who you can share your life with? Are you involved with your community? And by the time this visit was over, which was supposed to be one hour and it went on for like four hours, I flew home that night and I said, you know, you're 37 years old, you're perfectly healthy. He's 78 years old and dying from Lou Gehrig's disease. And he seems 10 times happier and more content with his life than you are. And there's something the matter with this picture. And that's why I began to go back the next Tuesday, next Tuesday, all the Tuesdays that he had left in his life. I was really trying to get the answer to, you know, what do we realize when we're looking death in the face, really looking at not the abstract death, but I'm going to be dead in six months kind of thing that really puts everything into perspective. And we were able to do like this last class together where every week we would bring up like one topic, uh, marriage, forgiveness, money, career, you know, and, and he would talk about it through the eyes of someone who was very close to death. And he would say, this matters, this doesn't matter. You think this matters, but when you get to where I am, and he would always stop and say, and you will get to where I am, you know, it's not gonna matter. And that's what that great last class was about, you know, and uh, I was absolutely blessed to have that experience and to think that he only had months left and he gave me every Tuesday that's a remarkable act of generosity. And you had no intention of writing a book when you no, were doing this? No, not at first, no. No, he made me take notes, and then eventually I bought a tape recorder because he said to me, when we're finished, I want you to write a thesis about this. And I didn't have the heart to say, you know, I'm not enrolled anywhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I going to write a thesis? I'm not in college. Don't you have to, you know, you don't just sit around and write theses. Uh, so I had all these notes and, uh, you know, about, I don't know, about a quarter of the way through, uh, I asked him very innocuously, tell me what you fear the most with your death. Thinking that he would say, you know, I'm going to choke to death or I'm going to this or, you know, whatever. And he said, I fear the dead. I'm going to leave my family. That was the first thing out of his mouth. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, uh, I've been dying like this, you know, for almost two years, and uh, these things aren't covered by insurance. You know, you're at home, masseuses, uh, around-the-clock care. He didn't have that. He didn't have a very great settlement from his life as a professor. And he said, when I die, they're going to have to sell the house, and I'm going to die twice. First, the agony of my leaving, and then the debt I'm going to leave my family. And it was only then that this idea came in the back of my head. I didn't say anything to him. How can I help him? You know, uh, that was my, that was probably the first time my instinct kicked in, like, how can I help someone who would help me all that time? And I got the idea to maybe write a book. I didn't tell him about it because I didn't want to fail. I didn't know if it would go in. But I had written a couple of books that had done pretty well, sports books. Mm -hmm. They had both been on the New York Times bestsellers list, whatever. So I put together this little kind of idea about talking to an old man about what's important in life when he's dying and we went to the publisher of those two books that had done really well we said would you would you consider publishing it? nah nah if it's not about sports you know come back when you got another one about sports literally they said that and then we tried to go around to other places nah it's boring uh, you're a sports writer it's depressing who wants to read what you have to say one guy i, I won't say the publishing house but uh, it's well known. He stopped me like right in the middle of my telling what was going on. And he said, hey, listen, I'm, you know, I'm going to save you some time. I don't think you even know what a memoir is. Why don't you come back in 20 years and maybe you'll be prepared to write it? Literally, that was the reaction I got. I remember leaving there in, almost in tears. I said that my literary agent was with me. I said, why can't they just say no? I mean, what, <laughs> well, what's with the ripping you to shreds, you know? You got to slap you. Yeah, slap you on the way out. So I honestly, Phil, I would have given up. You know, if enough people tell you something's a bad idea, you start to think maybe they're right. 
if it wasn't for the fact that this was for him, not for me. So I kept pushing. And three weeks before he died, we found a publisher, Double Day. And I went to him and I said, hey, Maury, I, know, I always remember this Tuesday. I said, I got some good news. He said, what? I said, you know this thesis that you're having me write here? Yeah. I said, well, I got a publisher, book publisher, and I'm going to publish a book about it. Really? Who? And I said, Double Day. He said, ooh, I heard of them. Because <laughs> he was so used to being published by these little tiny college presses. And I said, well, not only that, but I asked them to give us the advance money up front, and I want you to take all the money and pay off your bills, you know, so you won't have to die a second death, you know. And he cried, and, you know, I probably cried a little bit too. And that, to me, Phil, was the end of Tuesdays with Maury for me. Right. You know, like I had finally done one nice thing for this old man who had done so many nice things for me. And that was it. The writing of the book and everything that came afterwards was for the rest of the world. For me, I had finally learned, you know, to put somebody else ahead of me. And, and it was a nice lesson. Did that change him? Did that unburden him? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, he was astonished. I mean, you know, and his and his family, too. Um, we didn't know it was going to become this other thing, you know, uh, but that was enough, you know, and we, nobody thought, nobody thought that book was going to do anything. They, they published 20,000 total copies, total copies. Right. And when it came out and I was planning on just going back to being, you know, sports writer and all that. Uh, I wrote it very simply, you know, that was the whole goal was just, in fact, it was supposed to be a 300 page book when I turned it in. They called me up and publishers said, hey, we got a problem. I said, what? They said, well, we paginated this. This is like 170 pages. I said, mm, well, there's nothing more to tell. I told the whole story. And they said, well, I will just make it a small book. And if you ever see Tuesdays and like a little, yeah. it's a little book. Well, that was the reason because if they made it a big book, it would look like a comic book. You know, yeah. it was so thin. And they published 20,000 copies. I thought I'd have them in the trunk of my car for the rest of my life. And, uh, and then something happened. How many copies has it sold total now worldwide? 18 million or something like yeah. that. Yeah. 18 million copies. Yeah, something like that. That's touched a lot of lives. Yeah. It's also taught in lots of school systems around the world, which is very, very pleasing to me. Because, That's got to be gratifying. Well, for Maury. I mean, you know, he always told me he wanted on his tombstone a teacher to the last. And it's really beyond that, a teacher yet and still. It yeah. should read a teacher yet and still because he's being taught everywhere. And you know, Phil, he never read a word of Tuesdays with Maury. Really? Never read a word. And that's what I always tell people. You know, you think, you know, the, it actually became part of what The Five People You Meet in Heaven, which was my next book, was the basis of all these people thinking they don't matter, they don't count, they're not doing anything with their lives. And I always say, you know, look at Maury. He took time in his dying days to, to, to teach a wayward student on Tuesdays with no idea anything was going to come out of it. He died before he ever saw a word written, and yet he's alive all over the world. Oh, yeah. Millions, of, millions and millions of people, school children, have, have read his, his words. So you never know where the ripples from your pebble in the pond are going to go. And he rescued his family, which gave him the peace that he needed to leave this world in peace. Yep. You can duck and weave, but you gave him a hell of a gift. Now, you've written novels, including this novel, The Next Person You Meet in Heaven, which is kind of a sequel to The Five People You Meet in Heaven. Yeah. I say kind of a sequel because there's a through line to this, and... This is thematic in message to people, and I said this when we were talking earlier, this is life-changing in the fact that it's provocative in making people stop and think about what they're doing now, what their priorities are, and what they invest their life energy into. That's what you want, right? Yeah. What's your hope for the impact of this book, The Next Person You Meet in Heaven? Uh, not dissimilar to what I hoped would happen with The Five People You Meet in Heaven. That was inspired, it was my first novel, and was, it was inspired by an old uncle of mine, Eddie, 
who was 83 year old, a World War II vet, guy who talked like this, you know, grizzled New Yorker. And he always thought that his life didn't matter. And I adored him. Uh, and I would always say, of course it matters, Uncle Eddie. Nah, I never done nothing. I never been nowhere. I never went anywhere. And he died thinking that he was a nobody. So in that book, an 83 year old man named Eddie dies thinking he's a nobody by working in an amusement park where he's a mechanic and he dies pushing a little girl out of the way of a falling cart from a ride that breaks and he pushes her away feels her two little hands in his and then the world goes black he wakes up and he's in heaven he doesn't know if he saved a little girl and he meets five people from his life he finds out that the first stage of heaven is you meet five people from your life some of whom you might remember some of whom you don't and each of them tell you about one moment that changed them forever and changed him forever. And by the time his life is over, or his time is over with the five people, he finds out that this life that he thought was so insignificant actually was extraordinarily significant and affected all these people. And he finds out in the end that he did save this little girl, but there was a reason for it. And the point of that book was to try to send messages to people like my uncle there's no such thing as a life that doesn't matter. There's no such thing as a nobody. Everybody touches somebody. Like I said about Maury, you know, he didn't even know how much he touched me and how he would consequently touch the world. Everybody does that. All of our, as long as life is with people, your pebbles in the pond are going to send ripples through it. With this book, the next person you meet in heaven, it follows Annie, the little girl that he pushed out of the way. This is what happens to her when she grows up and she doesn't even remember the incident that happened. She kind of blacked it out. All she remembers is going to the amusement park and then coming home and life had kind of changed. Her mother, who's ashamed at the fact that she left her alone and got her in trouble like that, moves them away to another part of the country, changes their name, and she basically lives in anonymity, doesn't even know why she just feels weird about something happened in her life. But it sets her on this path where she thinks she just makes mistakes all the time. She remembers vaguely, something happened was my fault. And everything then from the rest of her life is kind of shaded with, it's my fault, I did something wrong, I did something wrong. She dies, at, again, at the start of this book, in a, in a she, young, she's married and she dies the morning after her wedding they're on one of those balloon rides you know the, the sunrise balloon rides and something goes really wrong and by the way i've heard from balloonists all over the place you know this doesn't happen yeah, a lot thanks I, said, a I, know, lot Mitch. I know i also heard from people in the amusement park business when i wrote that book saying you know the roller coasters are safe you know but i know i i, I always acknowledge that this is a crazy thing that happened but she dies and she also meets five people one of whom of course is eddie and along her journey she comes to find out that all these things that she thought were mistakes, and they're the kind of mistakes that we all make, actually there was a reason that they happened, they led to something else in her life, and she didn't even see it. And that's my hope for this book too, just as the first one kind of helped people who felt they were nobodies. I hope this one helps people who think, now everything I touch goes bad. Every time I get involved, it goes the wrong way. Maybe not. Maybe you're just looking at it that way. This is kind of like a exemplar or working examples of Ecclesiastes 3.11. To everything there's a season. Yeah. God has a plan that man cannot understand, but everything is beautiful in its own time. That's right. There's a purpose for everything. We just don't see it. This is just such a working example of all of that and how it all comes to fruition. You just bring it alive with Eddie and Annie and real people in real lives. Yeah. What do you think the experience will be and the lesson that will be learned when you see Chica in heaven? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I already know the lessons that she taught, that Chica taught me on earth. In fact, I incorporated them a lot into this the next person you meet in heaven because she died um, just before I started writing this. And in fact, in truth, I wanted to write about her. Um, I really wanted to write about her. It was so, f all of my emotions were about this little girl. And uh, some people close to me said, this is too soon for you to be writing about that. It's just weeks and months after. Wait, you get some perspective. And I 
battled against that, but ultimately I kind of put that emotion into this book. And so those who have read this book will see that there's a lot of, first of all, it's about a little girl who grows up. Then one of the mistakes that she makes in her life, mistakes, is that she gets involved with a guy too young, she gets pregnant, has a baby, and then the baby dies after just a couple of days. And so not only does she feel like she had a mistake getting pregnant, but then she feels like she wasn't really a mother because, after all, the baby only lived three days. And her emotions about not being able to protect that baby was exactly how I felt when she could pass away in, in our arms. And despite the fact that she lived almost two years with a brain tumor that normally takes children after five months, so she, you know, like quadrupled the odds, I can't tell you, Phil, the feeling of total abject failure that I felt when she breathed her last stayed with me, still stays with me. You know, no matter how many people tell me it's a disease, it wasn't, you know, you didn't give her the brain. I know all that intellectually, but you still feel like you failed. And to me, that's my, like a mistake. And so I, I put that sort of in Annie's life and blessedly in heaven without, I kind of don't want to ruin some of the part for people who will read it, but let's just say that she gets to find out the answer to her question, your version of the question you ask me about what are you going to do when you see Chica yeah. again. She gets that moment in heaven, and I hope I have that moment too. Well, and I think that moment will be inspirational for people. It's amazing to me, we all think that we're prepared particularly when you see it coming and you know it's coming. And I always tell people, do not let the sun set on you another day without saying to the people in your life what you need to say or doing with the people in your life what you need to do because you don't know whether you or perhaps they will be taken before the sun sets on this day. You can think that you've said everything and done everything, but there's no way we can be prepared for the finality that comes. You can think, I've known this is coming. I knew it. I know it. But when that last breath is taken, it's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't say this. Give me this. another minute. Give me another day. Yeah. And I think for many people, this book is that other day. Mm -hmm. I think this book will give people the ability to realize that maybe they're not gone. Maybe they're just waiting. Yeah. And that they'll have that other day. Well, that was, uh, you know, my, my Uncle Ed, who inspired the first one, he taught me Everyone says, what's your concept of heaven? I say, I only have one personal experience with it. That was my uncle. He claimed that he died during an operation, an open heart operation. And he said he floated above his body and he looked down and he saw his body on the operating table and the doctors, um, and then at the end of the table were all of his dead relatives and they were waiting for him. Now, in his case, he was a salty World War II veteran. So, of course, as kids, we would say, what'd you do, Uncle Ed? What'd you do? And he said, do. I told him, get the hell out of here. I'm not ready for any of you yet. And apparently he scared them right back to heaven. And then he went back in his body and he lived a little longer. But to me, that was heaven because, that you know, you only trust. You only trust stories about heaven from people that you trust, right? right? I mean, just because a preacher somewhere says this or that, well, you're never sure. But if a relative tells you, so I always believe that people are waiting for you. And then I kind of modified that and said, well, what if they're not just your relatives? What if they're people who interacted with you at some point or another? Right. But that whole idea of getting a chance to see somebody again and saying what you do, one of the people, and it's not going to ruin anything for the people in the book, but one of the people that Annie gets to meet in the next person you meet in heaven is her mother. Um, interestingly, in the first book, Eddie got to meet his father, although he never really spoke to him because they didn't speak, but he saw him. In this book, Annie gets to see her mother, who was such an integral part of her life, and, and, and she hated her and resented her because she, she smothered her with protection all her life because she, she felt bad that she had had this accident when she was eight years old. And when she sees her in heaven, there's this one moment where 
after the her mother explains to her everything, why she did what she did and what she didn't understand about her life, which of course we could all stand to have with our parents, right? Because whatever resentments we've had with our parents, we probably never really understood what they went through. We always look at them as just mom and dad. We don't look at them as human beings. And when she explains it all to her, finally her mother says to her, um, so can you say that you forgive me? And Annie says, oh, mom, you don't need to hear me say those words to you. And she says, no, I don't, but you do, you know? And, and it's true, you know, exactly what you said. You need to make that peace preferably while you're here, not when you get there, because I can't guarantee that this is the way that it works, okay? Yeah. I have to say this book does not come with a guarantee. You know, it, it's a promise, it's a hope, but it ain't a guarantee. But if it works out that way, it's a good trade. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it does. I hope it's uplifting, and it's, it's not a sad book, and it's, it's not, not about death. It's not a sad death. book at all. No. I mean, it's an uplifting book. You can't finish this book and not have a warm feeling inside. Yeah, that's my hope. I'm glad you wrote it, and I'm glad you brought it with you when you came to see me. I really appreciate it. Well, it's great to see you. Thank My you best for to taking Janine. Time. Thank you, and to Robin and everybody else and your family. Thanks for All your right. friendship. Talk to you soon.